so welcome to the video um this will be a physics education kind of video um and i don't know really how to start this so let's just have the intro Okay, too long, didn't read. Uh, summary basically at the beginning of this to help people understand what processes we're talking about. Uh, we're going to get more into detail in the next section, but for the moment, uh, this thing right here, this portion right here, is a brake master cylinder. At the front of it is a piston that is usually actuated by a um, uh, electric solenoid in the car which is attached to your brake pedal um, it can get more or less complicated than that based on the age but in general that's how things go you get a uh, this essentially is depressed as you press the brake pedal there's fluid in here this is this is your fluid reservoir there's fluid in here and it's forced through this hole and that hole right there into two into a set of lines those lines lead throughout the car, eventually ending in a set of brake calipers, okay? Now these brake calipers in here, these fit over top of your rotor. And in between the exterior body here, here and here, okay? And the rotor itself are pads, brake pads. They're the things you usually pay to replace kind of thing, okay? And what happens is, as that rotor there is spinning, the uh, brakes are depressed, and this piston here, which has a, which has fluid behind it, uh, expands out this way towards the center. As it does, it presses down on one brake pad, like so, and the other brake pad, which is captured. Um, sandwiches these, this rotor here. As that happens, as the pressure builds, they put more and more clamping force on the rotor and eventually pull it to a stop. Okay? Okay, so, brakes, relatively simple. Okay, um, this is a master cylinder. And if you take a look, there is the reservoir for fluid there. The top of the brake system is a, like a, 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 the plunger of a syringe. And it forces liquid down into the lines. Those lines take that to the um, caliper. In the caliper, there is a piston behind which that fluid builds. As that fluid builds, it pushes that piston out. That push piston presses the captured brake, uh, a captured brake pad against a rotating disc, which presses it against a, another pad, and between the two of them, they slow the disc. Okay, this is the fundamental of a what most cars have in them, which is a disc braking system. Okay, now prior to this, there was something called a drum braking system, which is basically the same idea. Okay, you had a wheel cylinder, you had a, a hollowed out drum, and the wheel cylinder would expand pressing the brake pads into the rotating drum and that would slow the car it's the same basic idea okay 
But to understand these simple concepts, we need to know some fundamental physics. First of all, most simply, because we are dealing with pressures, we have to know that pressure is equal to force divided by area, okay, or force over area. Then if we solve for force, we get pressure times area equals our force. The other thing you need to know is force of friction, okay? Now, force of friction has two parts, force of static friction and force of sliding friction, okay, or kinetic friction, okay? Static friction happens when you have something that isn't moving and you attempt to start it moving, okay? So, for instance, you are about to push your refrigerator, okay? And that refrigerator is very heavy. And as you put your shoulder into it, you put your shoulder in it, put your shoulder in it, put your shoulder in it. You build force behind it. You give it more and more push. Okay. Then the refrigerator starts moving. And you can ease up a little bit. Okay. That's because the force of static friction is more than the force of kinetic friction, okay? Well, sort of, okay? It actually looks like this. That straight line, well, not straight line. Well, it's a straight line. It's an inclined line. Leading up to the point is all equal to static friction. No matter where you put yourself on that line, you're in static friction then it drops off and becomes a, it becomes a flat line, right? That's your force of kinetic friction. It's always constant. As long as something's moving, that force is, is constant, okay? So, frictional force is a function of the two surfaces made together times the force being pressed that's pressing them down together okay or I should say it's a function of the coefficient between the two of them coefficient of friction between the two of them and the force pressing them together okay it's called force normal and the reason we call it force normal is partially because it's normal to the surface Okay. Normal is just a fancy word for perpendicular, okay? which means that if this is your surface, it is perpendicular. It faces this way. It's also called the normal force, normal force because it normalizes the situation. It's a byproduct of Newton's third law, okay? but we're not going to get into that. Just remember that it points out of the surface at a right angle. That's all we're worried about. Okay, so if you have an inclined plane, points right angle, right angle, right angle. Doesn't matter. Okay, simple as that. Here's the funky thing. How does this bring your car to a stop? Well, you have the brakes, the brake caliper here. You have the rotor, and then you have the wheel hub. Okay, and everything is rotating. Everything, the caliper isn't rotating, but the rotor is rotating and so is the wheel hub. In order to change the rate at which that's rotating, we must apply a torque, which is our third thing that we need to learn, we need to work on. Torque is a force at a given distance or radius. Okay? So, it is represented by a cross product cross products are these fancy things for for vectors and we're not gonna worry about them. okay it's F cross R we don't need to worry about them in this particular instance because the frictional force which is going to be causing our torque is always at 90 degrees to the radius so we get rid of the cross product completely 
And all we need, all we do is multiply the force times the radius, or force times the distance, however you want to put it. Okay, but how do we do this? Well, we work backwards. We start with F times R. But F is actually 2 times the frictional coefficient between the pads and the rotor times the uh, clamping force of the of the caliper. Okay. So now, where do we got a clamping force? Well, the clamping force is actually equal to the pressure pressure that the system can can uh, exert times the area over which it can exert it. Okay, so in this case, it would be the pressure of the system times the uh, times the surface area of the pistons of however many pistons there are in there. Okay. Now, this creates this nice long equation, right? Stop worrying so much. We don't have to do any maths. We just have to realize that if we alter something, we know that we know the result. So, for instance, if we alter the radius, change the radius to one and a half times itself. That means that we're going to get one and a half times the braking power, approximately. Okay? It's definitely going to go up. If we, if we increase the coefficient of friction between the pads and the rotors, we're going to increase our braking power. Now, how do we do that? Well, that's the hard part. Okay, how do I how do we identify what things change which things? Okay, well, area. The area of the uh, of the pistons is easy to understand. Okay, it's essentially the area of a circle. Okay, so. Here's the, here's the question. If you have a single piston caliper and you change over to a dual piston caliper the, where each piston is half the size of the original caliper, half the, half the size of the original, the original piston, the original caliper, are you gaining anything? No, you're not. You haven't changed the area. The pressure is the same. The area is the same. The clamping power is going to be the same. Now, if you change over to a caliper with two more, uh, with one more piston, but each piston is three fourths the size of the original caliper, well, then you've now got six fourths or one and one half the size of the original caliper, so you're Breaking power is going to go up. Okay. So, if you're planning on changing calipers, you want to measure the radius, uh, the radius or diameter of your original caliper's piston, and make sure that the caliper that you're getting has more surface area, has more piston surface area. Beyond this, how do you change the pressure? Well, the pressure is a weird, weird thing, right? 
You can go with a bigger um, master cylinder, obviously. That changes the pressure. Okay. And we're assuming that, that we're talking about the same pedal travel. Uh, as long as this, we have the same pedal travel, the same distance between where the pedal sits and where you pushed it each and every time, a larger master cylinder is going to create more pressure. But also, if you've ever heard of steel braided brake lines, the reason that they create more stopping power is because more they create a more efficient system. Again, we're talking about pressure that makes it down to the uh, to the caliper. So, if we're talking about pressure that makes it down to the caliper, steel braided brake lines make sure that less of that pressure is released by the expansion of the lines than uh, in, say, rubber tubing. Okay? How do we increase the radius? Well, we increase the radius by putting on bigger, uh, by moving the caliper out and putting on bigger rotors. Okay? Which is why you'll find that a large portion of performance cars may not have bigger, um, may use the same brakes as dozens of other mundane cars, may use the same calipers, same lines, and so forth, same brake cylinders and all that, but they'll have larger rotors. That'll be the only change. For instance, the BRZ, it uses all of the same hardware as a, I believe it's a Camry or Corolla, except the rotors, which are much larger in diameter. Okay? So that's one way, one easy way of getting more braking power. The other easy way is to add frictional force. Okay? Now, if you don't change your caliper, you can't change the actual force normal, like we talked about before. But you can change the frictional coefficient between the pads and the rotor. That's simple. You take off the rotor, put in better pads, close the rotor back up. Okay, that's why a large portion of people with performance cars run performance brake pads. In fact, if you own a BRZ, the first thing we need to do is go out and get performance brake pads. Okay. Why? Because, well, they use the same ones as the Corolla. Okay? Same brake pads as the Corolla. And those are meant for long life. Remember, as you increase frictional force, you're basically creating more sandpaper. Okay? It's going to wear away at both the rotor and the... Uh, brake pad faster so they'll need to be replaced more not to mention the fact that uh, higher performance brake pads are softer this is because softness create softness which I'll, I'll talk about in another video I'm not going to get into it now but the, the softness creates a better uh, creates more friction as a result, you can get more stopping power out of a softer pad. Okay. This is this is the end. Uh, if you like the video, you know what to do down below. If you dislike the video, again, down below. Basically, just head down below. Uh, leave a comment. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me what I'm doing right. Uh, if you feel like supporting me, you can support me on Patreon. The link is down below also. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video.